How does hormonal birth control impact training and performance? I've heard that many elite and pro, pro female athletes avoid it, and I'm wondering if that is because it's detrimental to performance, related to body composition concerns, or has other adverse effects on adaptations on, on our bodies or that our bodies make during training. So Amber, <laughs> you take it uh, away. <laughs> yeah. Uh, short answer is all of the above. So hormonal birth control does impact training and performance. And so I'll just, I'll restrict this, this discussion to hormonal birth control in particular. And this is just the use of synthetic hormones to influence the menstrual cycle to either make it more regular for birth control purposes. There's a lot of different health reasons that you might want to go on to a hormonal birth control. But the point is that you use synthetic hormones to manipulate the menstrual cycle. The problem with this discussion really is that there's not a lot of empirical research on this, which is very, very frustrating as a female athlete to want to find this kind of information to understand and feel like you're making a really informed decision about your body and what you're putting into it and how it's going to impact you, especially as an athlete and, and understanding how it's going to impact your performance. Um, there's just, there's not a lot of good research on this. With that in mind, I will say that I'll, just, I'll talk a little bit about some of some mechanistic things. And I think the bottom line with this, honestly, you talk to 10 different women on the same form of hormonal birth control and you will get 10 vastly different experiences um, in terms of both the pros and cons. So one of the things that's become really, really clear with these is how they affect your physiology is going to be very, very different than how it's going to affect other people's physiology. There are just so many different feedback mechanisms in these cycles and these hormones, different feedback loops in the body's physiology that it's really, really hard to make generalizations and say this particular hormonal birth control method is going to have this impact on your performance. It's just not that cut and dry. With all of that said, I will say that the birth control pill is a hormonal based birth control that is usually a monophasic, a biphasic, and a triphasic. The monophasic is it's the same hormonal dosage for three out of four weeks, and then you have a week of sugar pills. The biphasic is, um, I think, a steady estrogen, and then there's an increase in progestin, um, again, synthetic hormones, and then you have a week of sugar pills, and then there's a triphasic that manipulates both the levels of estrogen and progestin over the course of three weeks, but then again, you have a week off with the sugar, or I don't know if that one has the sugar pills or not. Um, all of this is to say that you're using a lot of synthetic hormones, uh, m mostly synthetic estrogen and progestin. And the synthetic hormones affect your body in a really, really different way than the natural hormones do. So some of those are really good. So the bottom line with this is it comes down to a cost benefit analysis on an individual level. Birth control can really help alleviate some symptoms that some women have with irregular cycles, PMS symptoms, endometriosis is a big one. So there are some really, really legitimate reasons that a hormonal birth control would be really, really beneficial. That said, when you're kind of flooding the system with these synthetic hormones, what can happen is you can get up to, um, I was looking at some of Stacey Sims research on this and six to eight times the levels of estrogen and progestin in somebody on a hormonal birth control pill relative to somebody who would just be having a natural cycle. So that's a lot. That's a huge increase in the level of these hormones. And all of these hormones have pros and cons to them. So when you're really flooding the system with them, you often get an increase in some of the side effects and the side effects without a lot of the benefits that come with the natural form of the hormones. So it's not awesome. But again, if being on a hormonal birth control alleviates debilitating premenstrual symptoms, that might actually be really, really worth it. So it really comes down to an individual kind of cost benefit analysis. And the other thing is, I would say, I mean, one of the things I did was I tried a lot of different kinds to figure out what worked for me because what might give you debilitating side effects on one, you know, trying another one might, you might find a balance where um, it's solving some problems for you, but the side effects aren't quite as bad. Um, a lot of the side effects are depression and anxiety related. And so those kinds of mental health related side effects, I think do, in addition to physiological impacts, can have uh, some real impacts on performance not only in training, but, you know, obviously, obviously in racing too. So it's a lot to consider. Um, one of the things that happens with the, the week of sugar pills. Um, so you're kind of flooding the body with these synthetic hormones for three weeks and you're taking a break when you're not on hormonal birth control and you're just having a natural cycle, that's, 
your low hormone phase. That's the lowest hormone phase of the entire cycle. And that's sort of when we see your highest capacity to do work in terms of training and performance because you're in the lowest hormone phase. But when you're on a birth control and you're taking that week off with sugar pills, you're not actually getting low hormone because now your body is rebounding with estrogen. And so your, your estrogen levels, your natural estrogen levels during that week are closer to what you would see in the first trimester of pregnancy than they would be during an actual period. So the time that you'd be having your period on a natural cycle versus on synthetic hormones, it's, it's a really, really different physiology that's happening there. Th there's no way to say it's a good thing or a bad thing. But absolutely, it has an impact on performance. How it's going to impact your performance is going to be really, really, really individual. And you just have to decide what's the best configuration for you. Why would you be using it? Uh, is it achieving those things for you? Are the side, side effects that you're experiencing balancing out as cons with the pros? I'm sorry, I don't have a, a really good kind of black and white answer for this one. <laughs> One, one thing that I have on, on a question on this, Amber, or actually more, I guess, in the, once again, these are just anecdotes, but I've spoken with professional level multi-sport and, and cyclist uh, athletes, and it's, it's kind of all over the map. Like some of them yeah. say like, yeah, like I would never dream of not being on birth control because of the performance effects or the consistency it brings my training. But then mm -hmm. I've heard the opposite. Um, I, I hope that like sharing this wouldn't sway anybody's opinion in one direction or the other, but at least to provide some context, did you find, um, athletes taking birth control to be more common? I mean, since you've, you know, you've raced across the whole gamut of amateur to professional, is it a common thing for athletes that are following a training schedule to use this or? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, there is an impact for sure. Um, but I don't, it's not the kind of thing that's going to make or break a career. Like it, it's not that big of a deal. Um, it's not, it, it's nothing in that kind of a range. It really, you know, so if you decide that that's the right thing for you, don't feel like you're, um, hindering yourself in a really significant way. Um, I will say, uh, let me think. I, I mean, I would say probably the vast majority of athletes that I was training and racing with did use some form of hormonal birth control for sure. Um, most of them were also on kind of this journey of figuring out which one was going to be the right one for them because most of us were experiencing some kind of a side effect. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very common. So don't feel like, you know, it's like, oh, if you're an athlete, you shouldn't do this, not by any stretch. It's just, it's a very, very personal decision that you have to make. And you, the key really is just to pay attention to how it's affecting you. Um, and sometimes that's really hard to figure out. Like I finally found one where I felt like, oh my, yeah, I mean, I, my, my side effects were all over the map. I mean, I was on one where I was crying myself to sleep every single night for three months before it dawned on me that this wasn't normal, <laughs> that maybe there was something else going on and I didn't really want to live like this. And then the second I changed to a different one, you know, I wasn't crying myself to sleep anymore. But then on the next one, I was getting uh, what they call melasma, which was like dark pigmented patches on your face. That wasn't an awesome side effect. Okay, so we went on the next one. So the next one that I was on, Actually, I, I didn't feel like I was having any, you know, any bad symptoms. Um, so I thought, okay, finally, I found the one that I would like. And I was on it for, gosh, years. And um, what ended up happening was I was on a vacation and I forgot to bring it. And so I thought, okay, well, I can hang for another, you know, I'll, I'll get back on it on my next cycle. And a couple of weeks into it, I was like, wow, this is really weird. I, I feel really happy. I feel <laughs> unbelievably lighthearted and optimistic about my life. <laughs> There's no real reason for me to feel like that. And it was, it, it, you know, it took a couple of weeks of this contrast in just mental and emotional outlook for me to realize that what that, 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 that particular one had done was like on a very slow, gradual slope had, had slowly but surely been um, increasing my, my anxiety and some depressive symptoms in a way that I wasn't really aware of because it was such a gradual change. And then it wasn't until accidentally having to stop it that I noticed this huge, huge difference just in my emotional outlook. Um, so it, it can be a really tricky thing too, to pick apart uh, what the symptoms you know, what are symptoms, what are just normal emotional reactions to life. And that's really a frustrating thing because the emotion that you feel as a result of these synthetic hormones is very, very real. And it's kind of this mind trip because you're like, okay, this is a real emotion that I'm experiencing in real life. Um, that's not founded on anything that's real. And that's a really, it's a 
it's a really bizarre experience um, and very frustrating, uh, but, but something that we grapple with. Amber, let me ask you a question. How, how hard is it to extricate the effects of the, the birth control with the effects of just training stress? So, I mean, is it, can you pin all these issues on the birth control or can you have to, because you said you went on vacation and all these things started to work or you started to feel better in general. Could it just be that you got away from your training stress and your body was rebounding? I mean, how do you know specifically that it was the birth control and not the, the, the removal of training? Well, I was training through that vacation. So that was one mm. thing. Um, she doesn't take vacations. <laughs> no, no, vacations. <laughs> no, no, no training vacations. Um, no, that one, that one was pretty clear to me though, honestly. And it's kind of hard to explain, but it was, it was a really fundamental shift in like total, like total frame of mind with everything. It was a, a totally different frame of mind in interpreting my communications and my relationships and how I felt about my training, how I felt about myself. I and mean, it was such a fun, like just a fundamental shift that I, I really, it, there's no way that it could have been anything else. Um, that said, teasing it apart on the other way around in terms of, you know, having been able to identify that I was having increased anxiety and depressive symptoms, um, that I don't know that that even would have been possible because I also think that that was a little bit of a gradual, like a gra gradual enough increase that would have been really hard to tease apart. And the other mm -hmm. thing is it takes your body a while to adjust to all of these things. So once you start a new one, you got to give it a few months to figure out, you know, how it's going to affect your cycle, how it's going to affect your physiology. And I mean, journaling, keeping really good notes in your training diary. I mean, all of these things are really, really important. It's, and again, like it's a tricky thing. There's no, there's no rubric for this. There's no protocol that says, okay, you know, if you're on this for three months and you feel these things and this is happening, it really is so subjective and so individual. It's, it's just something you kind of, I mean, you got to dive in and, and do the work and figure it out for yourself. Uh, I have to say PSA on this. So um, my wife, when she was 29, she had a stroke and they looked at, they did all these tests and the only risk factor was um, birth control. Um, so uh, people should know that birth control does increase your risk of a stroke. Um, I think with Yaz, with certain birth control, she was on orthotricycline, but with mm -hmm. Yaz, they actually had a lawsuit around it. And the important thing to know about a stroke, and this is with anyone too, with older, everyone should know this. Uh, if you, if you can get in within the two hours of when your stroke first happens with, they have a drug called TPA and it can be, you can be pretty successful. Once you get out of that window, you start to like, either they don't administer the TPA or they have to do this crazy thing with my wife. Cause we were out of the we were out of the window where they did a, um, they put this catheter in at her hip and went all the way up to her brain and released the TPA only where it was. But we were only, Reno had one of the only places in the nation um, at this time that had this kind of skill. So um, please Google signs and symptoms of a stroke. Maybe Tucker can put this in. Um, but one thing, a couple things, like if you see it's the smile, um, doing your fingers like a thumb to every finger on both hands. And if you can only do that on one hand and not the other hand, um, go in and see a doctor. A very, uh, this is also usually paired with a headache, um, blurred vision. Um, there's a whole bunch of other ones, but basically you can stick your tongue out and move it. If my wife has a headache, um, she takes aspirin every day for the rest of her life because you can't, uh, you can't prove or we can't prove that it was birth control, but she had zero other risk factors. It bubble test, all these crazy things um, to her. Um, but we do the things with the fingers right away. We do smiles because uh, she was completely paralyzed uh, one side of her body. Um, pretty severe. It was like a, a 10 out of 13 for those doctors uh, who know, wow. but she fully recovered, which was lucky. Um, she still has a little bit of problems with her left hand, but just be a, everyone. Cause I probably, everyone has someone, you know, on birth control and everyone yeah. uh, knows someone who is an older person that if you get in quick, it's really important. And so much so that some hospitals in your area might have a, like a stroke center or a stroke team. If you, if you do have someone that might be a risk group, I would actually research to see which is the hospital we should go to. And also um, call ahead, at least at our renown in Reno, they had a stroke team. And if they knew that a stroke team was, uh, they had like a, a rapid response stroke team and they would like assemble and get all those people together when you're in the ambulance or when you're on the way there, because minutes matter on this. Uh -huh. um, so those are kind of things to be aware of just in general. Um, I think everyone should be aware of. Yeah, well, and one yeah. last thing to add on this too, and, and sorry everybody if it's it's, it's a bit scary uh, saying this sort of stuff too, but um, birth control, at least from all signs pointing after working with fertility specialists was the cause of like seven years of infertility for us too. So like 
Um, so it was really, really tough and it's caused like a lot of health ramifications for, for my wife too. So it's definitely like a very individual choice and it's one where you have to kind of, like you said, Amber, right? Like you have to weigh the benefits and look at what could happen, what is happening and just stay heads up throughout the whole thing. Cause yeah. even though like we're all about performance on this podcast and, and, you know, like becoming a faster cyclist, which is definitely, you know, what we drive toward at the same time that should never come at the cost of like health. Right. So, no. which is why you brought up all of those other things that like, there's sure like you were riding and your riding was, was itself over here, but it's not worth any other costs. So, right. Right. And this is, you know, so take on messages, talk to your doctor about, all of your options and understand that you do have options and, and whatever options that you're seriously considering, have a really frank conversation with your doctor about what you do, your training level, what your concerns are, um, ask about the side effects, ask about the things that you need to be looking out for. Um, be really, really communicative with your doctor about what, how you are feeling, any side effects you are experiencing so that you can work together to find a good solution for you. I mean, I do know women who have, cycles that are just all over the map and birth control is a godsend for them because otherwise they wouldn't be able to train with regularity. Um, women who manage pain from endometriosis. I mean, there's a lot of really, really good, profoundly impactful reasons to use birth control, um, but they are not what it's, there's no free lunch. I mean, bone density is a huge concern. Fertility is a huge concern. Stroke is, a, I'm so glad you brought that up, Nate. That's a big one. Um, and we know that, you know, uh, in some cases, athletes are, can be prone to like DVT and things like that. So we really, really, yeah, this is, this is a really big, um, personal health issue as much as, as it is a performance issue. But, um, yeah, there's, mm -hmm. there's no free lunch on this one. <laughs> it's going to affect you one way or the other. It's just a matter of how it affects you as an individual and, um, and, and how that kind of weighs out in a balance. I'm glad you're here to talk about it, Amber. I mean, clearly <laughs> the three of us can't talk about it, but then also it's just, it's not very commonly discussed too. So no, um, and it's a shame that there isn't more research around it too. It would be, be really great to have a better mechanistic understanding of how these things work. It is a, it is complicated. It's really sure. complicated, but yeah. yeah, it is good to talk about. If you like this video, you should subscribe to our channel. Maybe even give this video a like with a thumbs up and a comment down below. If you want to see race analysis videos, you can click on it right over here. And if you want to get your coaching questions answered, you can click on it right over here. And if you want to become a faster cyclist, which you should, you should go over to trainerroad.com. It'll make you faster. We promise. We guarantee it, right, Nate? Guaranteed. <laughs> or your money back. Yes, it's true, actually. We, we really will do that. Yeah.